I'm Jeff Hunt from Austin, Texas, and I'm here at the Wisconsin Country Club in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, to give a talk to the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable on the third book in my series that looks at the Civil War in Virginia from the time Robert E. Lee's army crosses the Potomac after the Battle of Gettysburg through the end of 1863. The book that I'm going to be talking about tonight is Meade and Lee at Rappahannock Station, the first offensive action of the Army of the Potomac after the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is one of the most famous battles, but also one of the least studied battles in the history of the Eastern Theater of the American Civil War. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing what I discovered about this incredibly intriguing action, uh, putting it in the larger context of the Civil War. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in this book or any of the books in my Media League series, they're of course available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I've got them here tonight and happy to sign them uh, for anybody who uh, happens to stop by. And of course, good evening everyone. You can hear me okay? Yeah. All right, well, greetings from Austin, Texas, where it was a little bit warmer a few days ago uh, than it is here. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and be with you in this uh, lovely venue. Uh, it's only my second trip to Wisconsin, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to spend it with people who share the same passion for our history, and particularly this era of our history, as I do myself. Uh, so as Frank was mentioning, I've been writing a series of books uh, on the Civil War in Virginia from the moment that Lee retreats across the Potomac following the Battle of Gettysburg through the end of 1863. Uh, this is a period of the war that has received very little attention. As a matter of fact, it's received virtually no attention uh, except in a regimental history or you know, a chapter in a biography or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, if you're uh, even a pretty solid reader of Civil War history, you probably were left with the impression that after Lee gets over the Potomac, the Gettysburg campaign is over and nothing else of any importance happens in Virginia. In fact, probably nothing at all happens in Virginia until the arrival of Grant and the start of the Overland Campaign in May of 1864. But if you stopped and thought about that for a moment, it's highly unlikely that two of the most important armies in the Civil War sit down and do nothing for half a year. Uh, and in fact, they didn't. This period was very active. There was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of maneuvering. There were a lot of very important strategic decisions that were made about the deployment of troops between Eastern and Western theater uh, that are going to have a huge impact on the war, not only in 1863, but the way the war is going to proceed in 1864. So this six month period in Virginia is the important bridge between the Gettysburg campaign and the Overland campaign, both in terms of strategy, operations, generalship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I came to this topic when I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas and got into a conversation with one of my professors about the importance of the Gettysburg campaign. And we postulated that one of the best places you could look to see what the impact of the campaign really was on the war was to look at what happened immediately after. And when I looked, I found out I couldn't find out. Uh, so I had, to, I had to go and do the research myself and that led me to write this series of books. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about the third book in the series, and that is uh, Meade and Lee at Rappahannock Station. And this is the first offensive action undertaken by the Army of the Potomac uh, following the Gettysburg Campaign. It begins at uh, the start of November uh, of 1863. Uh, and uh, to sort of set the stage, um, Throughout most of August, the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia had been recuperating from the Gettysburg Campaign. Uh, not that necessarily General Meade wanted to sit around and recuperate, but he had been ordered to pull up on the upper Rappahannock River uh, because he was going to have to send 9,200 troops north to help enforce the draft. Uh, and General Halleck, the Union Major uh, General in Chief, says, we don't have any reinforcements to give you. I can't let you go get in a great big casualty-inducing battle. Uh, and so, you know, sit where you are. Uh, and so, the Federals sit on the north bank of the upper Rappahannock, Lee pulls below the Rapidan, the Confederate cavalry is in the middle in Culpeper County, and things stayed that way until mid-September of 1863. The Confederates send Longstreet west, 
Uh, the Federal Cavalry is sent into Culpeper to find out if that's actually what has happened. They find out that it did. And so Meade advances into Culpeper County, is trying to figure out how to get it Lee behind the Rapidan, and the Battle of Chickamauga happens. And the Federals send the 11th and 12th Corps uh, off to the west to counter Longstreet's move. And although the 9,200 troops that Meade had sent north begin to return to his army at about the same time, so that his strength is actually impacted not at all by the transfer of the 11th and the 12th Corps, uh, he believes that he is now too weak to undertake an offensive. Lee felt very differently, even though a third of his strength had disappeared with Longstreet's transfer. So Meade's got 88,000 men, Lee has 55,000, and Lee says, those odds are good enough for me, and he launched what comes to be known as the Bristow Station Campaign. So he outflanks the Army of the Potomac twice, driving out of Culpeper County in the first instance and then driving it back on Washington in the second. Uh, the uh, rear guard action at Bristow Station is the principal fight uh, in that campaign, although there was actually a lot of combat uh, in those first two weeks of October of 1863. Uh, but after the Bristow battle, uh, Meade has his army safely in the fortifications behind Bull Run and at Centerville. And although Lee would have liked to hover in northern Virginia and keep the Federals pinned close to the Potomac, he understood that Richmond could not supply his troops that far north. Northern Virginia was a wasteland after two years of war. He couldn't live off the, the countryside, and so he pulled back uh, behind the upper Rappahannock River, uh, and uh, that's where he was going to turn to make a stand. As he retreated, uh, he had his troops destroy the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And the Orange and Alexandria Railroad is a critical uh, piece of terrain here. So if you look at this uh, map, uh, you'll see that the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which uh, starts on Alexandria and the Potomac, runs southwest, uh, crossing into uh, Culpeper County above the uh, upper Rappahannock, uh, at Rappahannock Station, and then it runs down to Culpeper Courthouse, and then it makes a turn to the south, crosses the Rapidan at Rapidan Station, and goes on down to Gordonsville, where it makes a connection with the Virginia Central Railroad, which links the bounty of the Shenandoah Valley to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad that then moves down uh, toward Richmond and Petersburg. So the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, 50 miles of it, running from Culpeper back to the Potomac, is the federal supply line. Everything that the Army of the Potomac needs comes along that single track ribbon of iron. And without that railroad in functioning condition, Meade cannot advance. And so as Lee's troops pull back after the Battle of Bristow Station, he orders his troops to obliterate the railroad. And I do mean obliterate the railroad. This is actually a picture that was taken of the damage uh, that was done. So they pulled up all the rails. They laid the tracks on them, they burned the rails, warped the track, but they also destroyed every bridge, every culvert. They even chopped down the telegraph poles running alongside the track, burned every railroad station. Federal troops who traced uh, this, uh, this ground uh, in the pursuit of the Confederates uh, are universally amazed at how thorough the destruction of this railroad line was. Men who had seen two years of war had never seen anything quite like this. So that tells you something. Uh, and so Lee hopes that this might prevent Meade uh, from undertaking a fall campaign, that it will take the Federals so long to rebuild this railroad that the clock will run out, winter weather will set in, everybody will go into winter quarters. Uh, that's, he, he doesn't think that that's what's going to happen, but he kind of hoped that it might, but he understood it probably wouldn't, and in this regard, he's correct. The Federals are going to get this railroad rebuilt in about two and a half weeks. So the advantage of the industrial north, you can obliterate a railroad. Three weeks later, the Federals have put that same railroad uh, back in operation. And this means uh, that Lee has to figure out uh, how he is going to defend against a renewed federal advance. So here are the positions at the end of October of 1863. The Federals have been inching south at the pace of railroad repairs, and by the end of the month, the Army of the Potomac is basically here uh, between Warrington uh, and uh, the Orange and Alexandria. That the Warrington, of course, is linked to the ONA by the Warrington branch of the same railroad. The Confederates are here uh, below the uh, upper Rappahannock River. Uh, and so this is basically where the two armies are. Now, there is 
difficulty for Lee in staying in Culpeper County. There's a reason that Meade had not fought there in October. There's a reason that Lee had not decided to stay there in August of 1863 following the treat from Gettysburg. And that's because this particular piece of terrain, essentially halfway between Richmond and Washington, is militarily treacherous in the extreme. It's a beautiful part of Virginia. If you've ever been there, it is a sight to behold, easy on the eye. Uh, the Virginia government has just voted to make a large part of Culpeper County a Civil War state park uh, that eventually the NPS is probably uh, going to wind up uh, inheriting. Uh, but from a military perspective, this is an awful, awful place. Uh, to put an army and there are a couple of reasons for that so uh, we have the county formed by the upper Rappahannock River which is flowing from northwest to southeast where it meets the Rapidan River which is flowing more or less uh, from west to east and the, the flows into the Rappahannock which then goes on down to Fredericksburg and from there uh, into Chesapeake uh, Bay so uh, if you look at it these two rivers, which form the northern and eastern and southern boundaries of Culpeper County, sort of look like a V laid on its side. So I refer to this as the Culpeper V, with the mow uh, of this opening toward the Blue Ridge Mountains, the foothills that gradually work up uh, toward those uh, majestic uh, pieces of terrain. Uh, Robinson's River, which is really diminutive, I mean, it looks like a wide creek. Uh, except when it's raining and flooding, uh, makes up a good part of the western border of Culpeper uh, County. Uh, neither one of these rivers is very wide, uh, you know, maybe about 20, 25, 30 yards across at most. They're not especially deep, four, five feet deep in most places. There are lots of fords along each of the rivers, uh, but they're only crossed by bridges in two places, and that's where the Orange and Alexandria uh, spans the streams at Rappahannock Station and at Rapidan Station. Uh, these fords, however, are natural bottlenecks for moving armies, and in addition, these fords could disappear very quickly if there was even a you know, sort of modest rain upstream. The reason it's called the Rapidan is because it can rapidly rise to flood stage. And if you've ever seen these rivers at flood stage, and I, I've had the opportunity, they become very big, very wide, and very angry very quickly. And of course, for an army that was to fight and lose a battle inside the Culpeper V, it would find itself having to retreat across one of these rivers very quickly because this is not wide. It's only 23 miles between the upper Rappahannock and the Rapidan if you follow the railroad. And of course, the further east you go, the narrower that space becomes. So if you fight a battle defensively in the Culpeper V, you lose that battle and you're forced into a retreat, you're not going to go very far before you're going to have to start funneling over a river. And if there's a rain that suddenly happens upstream, those river fords can disappear very quickly. Uh, and even if that's not the case, you funnel into these fords, you slow down, the enemy has a chance to potentially catch up with you uh, and maul at least the rear of your army. This is all compounded by the fact that as beautiful as Culpeper is, it lacks good defensive terrain. There is no spot in Culpeper County where you can anchor both the left and the right flank of a battle line or anchor them in a place where the enemy could not, by a rapid flank movement, quickly get between you and the river to your rear. And for this reason, Lee has said in August of 1863, there is no field for battle inside Culpeper County, and he pulled his infantry below the Rapidan. It's why Meade, in October of 1863, when Lee outflanked him and then came down on him from the west, uh, from the direction of Madison County, said, we're not going to stand and fight in Culpeper, we're going to retreat above the Rappahannock uh, to uh, safer uh, ground. Another difficulty with Culpeper County is that it's sort of in a bowl. So the ground on the south bank of the Rap Rapidan is higher than the ground inside Culpeper, and the same is true for the north bank. The ground on the north bank of the upper Rappahannock is higher than the ground in the southern portion. Uh, of the county along the river. And what does that mean? It means that if you're inside Culpeper County, the enemy can use this high ground to mass out of your sight, 
and then rapidly cross some of these fords uh, and perhaps force you to fight a battle in a place where you don't want to fight. So this is why neither Meade nor Lee nor even John Pope or Stonewall Jackson had ever wanted to fight a major action here. Uh, the reason why the Confederates after their victory at Cedar Mountain don't hang around and retreat back across the Rapidan. It's just a really bad place to have an army. And yet this is exactly where Lee decides he's going to make a stand following the Bristow Station campaign. And he wants to be here for a couple of reasons. First off, although this is not good defensive terrain for a Confederate army that was wanting to launch an offensive into the north, this is the great jump off point for the Shenandoah and Loudoun Valley. So this is a springboard for an offensive in 1864 if Lee wants to make it. Uh, of course, this is also 25 miles closer uh, to the Potomac. Uh, and then being behind the Rapidan, that means it's 25 miles farther from Richmond and more of a buffer for the Confederate capital from the next federal offensive. And in addition to that, Lee did not want to surrender all of the ground that he had reclaimed in the Bristow campaign. He didn't want to retreat all the way behind the Rapidan. And so militarily, he has to decide is this a place where I can make a stand or should I go back behind the Rapidan? And the reason he doesn't want to go back behind the Rapidan is actually fairly simple. Now, the fords along that river are heavily fortified. They're on higher ground than you have in Culpeper. So if the Yankees were to attempt to attack directly across the river into those fortified positions, that would be suicide. But there are a lot of fords and it's a long river. And even if Lee spreads his army out to the maximum extent practicable, he can only cover about 25 miles of that river. And so there would still be fords to his left and fords to his right that he cannot guard with anything against cavalry patrols. And that means that there's really no way for him to prevent the Federals from outflanking him. And if he gives up Culpeper County, then the Federals could cross the river to the east along his right at Germana or Ely's or Culpeper Mine Ford and plunge into the wilderness where the Battle of Chancellorsville was fought. And if they move fast, they could get south of the Army of Northern Virginia to Spotsylvania Courthouse and cut Lee off from Richmond. And he would have to make a rapid retreat down to the north of the South Anna River uh, to shield his capital. This sounds familiar to you. It's basically uh, what is going to be attempted by Grant and Meade at the start of the Wilderness Campaign. And the only response that Lee could have to that is to move out of his camps, which are uh, kind of based around Orange Courthouse and moved down the Plank Road and the Orange Turnpike to hit those federal columns uh, before they got too far south. But this is risky. If you don't get word quick enough, the enemy can get below you before you can react. If it rains and the roads become muddy, you might not be able to move fast enough. And so this puts Lee in a completely reactive stance. He has to wait to see what the enemy is going to do, and then he has to rely on being able to move quickly and uh, have the Federals move slowly, or this is all going to go very badly for the Army of Northern Virginia. If Lee stays up here in Culpeper County, however, then he's got more possibilities. First off, he could launch an offensive campaign in the spring into the Shenandoah Valley if he wants. If Meade, up here around Warrenton, tries to evade Lee by moving through Madison County, he'd have to let go of his supply line in the Orange and Alexandria, rely on wagons to move through Madison County. The only thing off in this direction is Gordonsville, and that's 60 miles from Warrenton. And before Meade could ever get there, Lee from this position in Culpeper could come out and hit him in the flank. The other option, of course, for Meade is to either make a frontal attack or to try and slide down around Lee's right. But if he puts a bridgehead on the north bank of the river, right here at Rappahannock Station, high ground that would allow him to have a fairly shallow bridgehead, wouldn't require a big commitment of troops, but would provide a springboard for offensive action against Meade. So if Meade were to try and sidle down toward Fredericksburg, in a rapid march to get around the Confederate flank, basically attempting to do what Burnside did at the start of the 1862 Fredericksburg campaign, Lee could attack out of that bridgehead and get astride the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, put his army on Meade's supply line, and put it between him and Washington. 
which of course he knows that Meade cannot allow to happen. So that means that Meade probably isn't going to move to the left or the right, but the only way that he can attack the Confederates uh, frontally uh, is to send a good part of his army, probably half of it, to either attack or to seal off the Confederate bridgehead at Rappahannock Station. The fortifications there ought to keep the Federals from successfully attacking that spot, and since the Confederates could counterattack out of it, Meade has to put enough force there to prevent that from happening, and the only way he's going to get at Rappahannock Station is probably to come at it from the rear, which means that he would have to swing part of his army and cross the Rapp upper Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford, where high ground on the east bank uh, of the river totally dominates the crossing point. The Confederates could make no effective defense at Kelly's Ford, but that's what Lee wants. He's willing to let half of Meade's army cross at Kelly's Ford, uh, while the other half is stomping here at Rappahannock Station, and when that part of Meade's army gets on this side of the Rappahannock River, Lee could throw the bulk of his army against it, defeat it in battle, shove it back against the river, and either maul or destroy it. So what Lee's really doing here is he's developed a defensive strategy that allows him to go on to the offensive, that would force me to divide his army and have half of it walk into a trap where Lee could throw the bulk of his army against the half of Meade's that's done so and then destroy it. So this is a very daring strategy. It has certain risk, and the primary risk is that the fortifications at Rappahannock Station can stymie a good chunk of the Army of the Potomac long enough to allow the counterattack at Kelly's Ford to happen. But Lee is willing to take that risk, and as far as the kind of risk that Robert E. Lee has taken before, this one is sort of a, of a normal order of magnitude. General Meade, his opponent, Sitting there at Warrington can read a map just like Robert E. Lee. And Meade is a highly competent general who had avoided in the Bristow campaign falling into the same kind of trap that had discomfited John Pope in August of 1863. And Meade looks at the map and he notices that the Confederates have this bridgehead at Rappahannock Station and he understands what it means. He's got essentially three offensive options. One is to go through Madison County to either try and get at Gordonsville or to swing in and hit me in Cul or hit Lee in Culpeper County, uh, but leaving the ONA, relying on wagons, that's not really a viable option. Lee knew it, Meade knows it. Attacking straight across the river means walking into Lee's trap, and Meade sees that trap. He understands, I'm going to have to put half of my army to seal off Rappahannock Station, cross the other half at Kelly's Ford, and before I get that half completely over the river, the whole of the Army of Northern Virginia is going to come pounding down on it, and that's probably not going to work out to my advantage. I have no interest in walking into this clever little trap that my opponent has laid for me. So my best option is to very quickly, before the Confederates can react, and before they even know what's going, going on, slip down to Fredericksburg, cross the river there quickly, seize the high ground south of town and fortify it before Lee can intervene. And if he attacks me, he has to attack me while I've got the high ground, Fredericksburg in reverse. He probably won't do that, but he'll pull back to the North and South Anna River where he's a lot closer to Richmond. And better than that, as far as Meade is concerned, making this slide down toward Fredericksburg accomplishes something that he has begged Lincoln for permission to do since August, and that is to abandon the Orange and Alexandria Railroad as an axis of advance. Not that the ONA can't supply his army, it can. The problem is, it goes nowhere that the Army of the Potomac is interested in going. It sidles away from Richmond. And since the whole railroad runs through Confederate territory, I have to deploy troops along its entire length to defend it. It's running through Mosby's Confederacy. The Confederate raiders and guerrillas can tear that railroad to pieces and disrupt the Army of the Potomac supply line, and if they were to do it at an opportune moment, it could be disastrous. Right now, sitting at Warrington, Meade is spending 5,000 infantry to guard that railroad. 
And those are 5,000 soldiers he doesn't have to put on the firing line at a time when he figures the Army of Northern Virginia is almost as strong as himself. Now it's not, but at the end of August, at the beginning of September of 1863, it was. Both armies had recovered very quickly from Gettysburg, so that on September 1st of 1863, each had the same strength they did on July 1st of 1863. Lee was just under 73,000 men. Meade was around 88,000. And although Lee is a lot weaker now that Longstreet has gone, as Meade sees it, infantry to infantry, the armies are very close in strength. Yes, I have a lot more artillery. I have a lot more logistic troops. I have a lot more cavalry. But they're really not important when it comes time to fighting a battle. And especially since I suspect the Confederates are going to fight henceforth behind entrenchments, I need a three to one margin two to one at least, in order to have any hope of success. And right now, I've got about 1.4, 1.6 to one. And that's not enough. More importantly, Meade is also worried that the North is running out of manpower. Now, this is something that you know, it seems foreign to us because you know, we're, we all know the North has a much larger population. Uh, 80, 800,000 immigrants come into the North over the course of the war. The, the Union's preponderance in manpower as well as preponderance in industrial power is going to be the deciding factor in how this thing turns out. But if you stood in Meade's shoes in the fall of 1863, that's not so clear. Volunteering has dried up. All the two-year enlistments expired, and almost all of those men went home. In May and April of 1863, most of the three-year enlistments are going to expire, and why should we expect any of those guys to hang around? Because the 1862 guys didn't hang around. If you look at the course of the battles, they are getting bigger and they are getting bloodier. Gettysburg, worse than any of them so far. And the Army of the Potomac in each of those battles is smaller than it was in the battle that preceded it. So if I have to advance down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad against no particular point Lee is compelled to defend, he can just keep backing up. He backs up, I advance, but as I advance, what do I have to do? I have to spool out infantry to guard the railroad. So every 10 or 20 miles south we go, I'm 1,000 men weaker. Lee can back up. 40 miles, find perfect ground to turn and make a stand, dig himself in. I get there, now I'm spending 10 or 15,000 men guarding the railroad. I already don't have enough infantry. And even if I manage to win a battle, all I'm going to do is shove Lee back closer to Richmond, give him a shorter supply line to a stronger position, and I'll be that much weaker. And if I follow him and I spend more troops to defend the railroad, I'll be weaker yet. In fact, the Army of the Potomac could wind up being smaller than the Army of Northern Virginia, at which point Lee could turn the tables and attack me, and the Union cause is sunk. The draft is in place, but it led to riots. It forced me to send 9,200 men north to get it going again. And there's no guarantee it's going to bring in the numbers of troops that are necessary. Look at all these deserters that are, you know, all these conscripted guys who are deserting, the bounty jumpers. And it's not just numbers, as far as Meade is concerned, the caliber of troops that the draft is bringing in are all but worthless. You can't force men to fight with the kind of valor and vigor, the willingness to die that is necessary to win this war, he says. So fighting battles for the sake of, sake of fighting battles that just push the enemy back into ever stronger positions is a fool's errand as far as Meade is concerned. And that means that advancing down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad is not wise. What I want to do is I want to shift the army to Fredericksburg because when I do that, I can change our base to Ikea Landing on the Potomac, and then I've only got 15 miles of railroad to guard between the Potomac and Fredericksburg, and I'll be in a better position to launch an advance on Richmond in the spring of 1864. He had made this proposal in August, and Lincoln and Halleck had said no. He had made it again in September and October, and Lincoln and Halleck had said no. But now, after the Bristow campaign, when Meade's arguments about how vulnerable position in Culpeper County was and the difficulties of guarding the railroad, he figures Lincoln and Halleck must surely now get it. They have to understand what I was saying. And so this time, they're going to let me do what I want to do, which is to slide down to Fredericksburg before Lee knows that I'm doing this. It's essentially the same plan that Burnside had in November of 1862 because the armies are in exactly the same place that they were in November of 1862. There's nothing new for anybody in where these two armies are positioned. 
uh, in November of 1863. So Meade's confident that this time he's going to be able to get to do what he wants, that this is the best plan uh, for the army. He's had this zigzag back and forth argument with Lincoln and Halleck ever since Gettysburg. They, the, these three men do not understand each other. They, do, they talk past each other. And there's not really a mesh here. Uh, Lincoln and Halleck have forgiven Meade for not destroying Lee at Williamsport when he was trapped on the north bank of a flood of Potomac, but they have not forgotten it. And everything he proposes is seen through that spectrum. And every time Meade talks about lines of supply and all this kind of stuff, he's, they can't argue with what he's saying. The difficulty is the voice they're hearing is George McClellan. And McClellan always used all that stuff as an excuse not to fight. That's not what Meade's doing. Meade wants to fight, but he wants to fight where he thinks he can win and where he, his victory will have a decisive result. But this is not the way that Lincoln and Halleck say it. But he thinks for a moment that he's going to get to do what he wants to do. And he actually begins the preparations for this move rapidly to Fredericksburg. And he sends Halleck word, this is the move I'm preparing to make. And the only thing I need from you is to tell me if I'm not allowed to make it. And he's not expecting to get that, but that's exactly what he gets. And so his plan is disapproved. And Halleck says, look, we said no in August. We said no in September. We said no in October. Why do you think we're going to say yes in November? There's no need for a change of base. You're simply transferring difficulties from one spot to another. Wherever you go, you're going to find the Confederates in front of you. Wherever you go, the Confederates are going to dig in. It's going to be just as hard to fight and beat them at Fredericksburg or somewhere between Fredericksburg and Richmond as it is somewhere along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Let us remind you, your job is not to take Richmond. Your job is to go out and destroy the Army of the Northern Virginia and to start chewing it up and wrecking it as quickly as you can, wherever you can find it. So no change of base. You can make whatever operational move you want, but a change of base, going to Fredericksburg, not going to happen. You're not going to take the Army of the Potomac back to the scene of its worst disaster almost a year to the day that it occurred. And this infuriates me, because as far as he's concerned, all the military logic is on his side, and he's right. It is. But military logic is not the only factor here. There are other things that have to be considered. And so he writes an angry letter to his wife. My plan is disapproved. And Meade really feels put out. As far as he's concerned, Lincoln and Halleck have given him no guidance to speak of. Half the time, they're dictating to him what he must do. Stay on the upper Rappahannock. Go find out if Longstreet's gone. The other half of the time, they're saying, figure it out. We want you to do something. Come up with something. Figure it out. And he writes to his wife. Uh, this is one of the things I discovered in my research because in, in the volume of letters that was published by his son post-war, this letter's not in there. This letter is in, in his papers at the uh, Pennsylvania Historical Society. He writes to his wife, Margaret, no doubt Lincoln and Halleck would be delighted if I was to fight a battle and win. But essentially they want to keep their fingerprints off any defeat so that in case there's a disaster, I could be made the scapegoat as has happened to all of my predecessors. And he says, I'm not going to play that game. So he can't do what he wants to do. And for a lot of generals, that would be it. This late in the year, me could say, well, I guess we should just go into winter quarters. He could find a reason not to move. But Meade is a dutiful and competent officer, and he follows orders. And his orders are, you're going to continue to move along the Orange and Alexandria. And so he says, all right, if I can't make the move I want, I'll make the next best move, which unfortunately is to do exactly what Robert E. Lee wants me to do. Because there's no other option. So just as Lee wishes and anticipates, Meade divides his army in half. He puts the right wing, which is the 5th and the 6th Corps, 26,000 men, under command of Major General John Sedgwick, who is the ranking Major General. In the Army of the Potomac, his commission actually predates Meade's by five months. And then he puts his left wing under the command 
of Major General William F. French, the next highest ranking general in the Army of the Potomac, he gets the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Corps, or about 29,000 men. And what are these forces going to do? They're going to start early on the morning of November 7th, about 13 miles away from the upper Rappahannock. Sedgwick's going to bring the 5th and the 6th Corps down against Rappahannock Station, and French is going to bring his wing down to assault at Kelly's Ford, get across the river, and walk into Lee's trap, which the Federals know is a trap. They know that they'll get across at Kelly's Ford. The Confederates can't stop them. Topography's all on their side. So how do we prevent this from becoming the disaster that Lee intends it to become? What Lee, or rather what Meade wants Sedgwick to do is to attack and take the fortifications at Rappahannock Station if possible. Meade's not sure it's possible. And he warns Sedgwick, they're very strong fortifications. We don't know a lot about them. They might be completely impregnable. At the very least, you must seal them off and prevent the Confederates from counterattacking out of them. But the ideal thing would be for you to attack them immediately, overwhelm them, and get yourself across the river at Rappahannock Station so that both wings of the army are getting over the Rappahannock at basically the same time, and then we can link up at Brandy Station, and Lee will have to fight the United Army of the Potomac instead of one half of it divided by a river and six miles of road between Rappahannock Station and Kelly's Ford's crossing. So this is as good a plan as Meade can come up with, and to his credit, he does everything necessary to make it work. He doesn't necessarily think it's gonna work, and it's not the plan he wants to carry out, but he's way too good an officer to simply throw up his hands and say, I can do nothing, and he's also too good of a man to say, I don't wanna do this, I'm gonna go ahead anyway, and enter into the enterprise half-heartedly in a way that would almost ensure failure. No, he, he, he does everything he can to make this a success. Does that mean he wants to do it? No, and I know this is probably too small uh, for you guys to, to read back there, but this is a letter that he writes to his wife, Margaret, on the evening before he is going to launch his operation. And he basically tells her, tomorrow I'm gonna to try and cross the Rappahannock against resistance, and from everything I know about trying to assail a fortified river, I am not overly sanguine of success. I'm going to give this my all, but I don't think it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, I don't know what I do next. I'm going to be out of plans. The, the thing I want to do, I'm not being allowed to do. And the thing that I now am forced to do is probably not going to be something the Army can pull off. And he's, he has been stressed and anxious ever since Lee got across the river uh, at, at Williamsport, and now he writes to his wife, Margaret, I am in such a mental condition that I am not fit to write. Indeed, I try and avoid writing as much as possible. He says, I thought before I was assigned to command of this army, I had a pretty fair idea of what the position entailed, but the realities have gone so far beyond my wildest expectations, I bitterly regret not having refused the honor when it was offered. I wish I didn't have this job. I wish I had not accepted this job. This is the most awful place you could possibly imagine a commander to be. And yet, I'm going to do my best. Even if my best will never be good enough for Lincoln, it will never be good enough for Stanton, it will never be good enough for Halleck, to do my best. And if I fail and I get fired, I will accept that result just as happily as they accepted being appointed to the command. And so, not the best mindset necessarily to go into a major offensive operation, but this is where Meade's brain is. So the first fighting of the day, November 7th, 1863, will take place at the village of Kellysville, which is on the west side, or the southern side, uh, of uh, Kelly's Ford, where French is coming. Uh, that sector is lightly defended. Uh, this is Ramsur's brigade uh, of Rhodes Division that's in charge of the sector, but Ramsur has gone home to get married. Uh, so Colonel William Cox has command of the brigade. Uh, he's got the second North Carolina Infantry, which is his own regiment, now under his Lieutenant Colonel William Stallings, who is holding entrenchments 
at Kelly's Ford. He's got seven companies here, about 225 other men. His other three companies are upstream and downstream guarding uh, smaller Fords. These entrenchments here are good enough to fend off harassment or a minor raid, but they're not gonna stop a major assault because on the east bank of the river is high dominant ground. The Federals get guns up here, they look down on the entrenchments and Kelly's Ford literally like fish in a barrel. And for 700 yards behind these fortifications is a broken open plain that leads to the wooden encampment of most of Ramsier's brigade. And the closest support, 30th North Carolina, 500 men under Lieutenant Colonel William Sillers and the Fluvanna Artillery uh, under Captain John Massey, an unusual Confederate battery because it's got six guns instead of four, which was the standard. But all these troops are supposed to do is buy time delay. You're not going to stop any federal attack here, but we need a couple of hours so that Rhodes can throw his division into line. We can dispatch Edward Johnson to reinforce him. Remember, this is what we want the federals to do. Lee and his commanders have already worked out. This is the reaction. This is what we do if the federals make the move. So you just need to buy us some time. You're not supposed to make a prolonged defense. We don't want to suffer any casualties here that can be avoided. So the Federals do this with extreme competence. If General Meade had any doubts about William French being able to command, uh, the, he's gonna feel a lot better after what happens at Kelly's Ford. So the Federals get their artillery up on that high ground. Uh, Alfred Wode is with them and he drew this, uh, this uh, sketch of the action. So this is that high ground and you can see way down there is Kelly'sville. And then that's that 700 yards of open ground. You can see how the Federals dominate all of this. I mean, this is like me standing up there uh, in that galley behind you looking down on you. So the Confederates are not going to hold this ground. But they try. Uh, and unfortunately, they try a little bit too hard. The Fluvanna artillery trundles out and it goes into battery and begins exchanging fire with three Federal batteries. And it's quickly driven from the field very gallant effort, but 18 guns versus six, uh, and then uh, that's just not gonna work. Uh, Colonel Sillers makes a very gallant but foolish decision. He tries to move his 500 men over that 700 yards of open terrain to reinforce Stallings uh, at the fort. And of course, as they try and cross all that ground at the double quick in line of battle, the Federal artillery takes them under fire, the terrain breaks up their formation, they run into a couple of fences that break it up even more, and by the time they get into Kellysville, they're completely demoralized. And most of the men simply go into cellars and, and go into buildings and try and avoid uh, being killed. Stallings, on the other hand, has managed to at least stop the initial federal thrust. So uh, the first U.S. sharpshooters were at the head of the federal column. They get to the riverbank. The Confederates open up on them from these fortifications, and the sharpshooters go to ground. They take cover, and you got a firefight going. And of course, that's not the idea. So Major General David Burney, who's in command of the lead division, says uh, this is not what we want to have happen, and he orders an assault. That order goes to Lieutenant Colonel Casper Tripp, who is the real brain behind the Berdan sharpshooters and is in command of the first U.S. sharpshooters at, at the moment. And Tripp, who is a very competent and experienced officer, says, the last thing I want to do is send my men straight across this forward into the teeth of those Confederate defenses. So he sends four companies about 150 yards upstream to cross the river at a point that he hopes is not heavily defended, maybe not even defended at all. They'll cross and then they'll hit the flank of the Confederate fortifications. It's a defended spot, but only by a detachment of sharpshooters. Ten of those Federals are shot down in the river, but the rest get across, and it works the way it's supposed to. They manage to hit the flank of the Confederate fortifications, and then Tripp brings the rest of the first sharpshooters right across the river. There's Woe drawing a picture of what it looked like, and in hand-to-hand -hand combat, very vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Federals take the fortifications. And at that point, Stallings says there's no point in holding the town, and he orders a retreat. Uh, a bunch of the guys from the uh, 30th North Carolina decide that they don't want to run that 700 yards through artillery fire back to their starting point, and they hang around to get captured. But in about two hours' time, only 30 minutes of actual infantry combat, French has Kelly's Ford. 
and he got it pretty cheaply, seven dead and 35 wounded, as opposed to 45 dead Confederates, 78 wounded and 295 missing, almost all of whom were unwounded prisoners of war. And French immediately wades a division over the river. He brings up his pontoons. He begins to lay them. By nightfall, he'll have two divisions over, a third fixing to cross, the second corps massed behind him, ready to come over uh, at first light. The first corps on its way to join them, and 29,000 Federals are beginning to walk into the trap that Robert E. Lee wants them to walk into. And Meade is acutely aware of this. He wants to reunite his army as quickly as possible. The problem with doing that is at Rappahannock Station. Can Sedgwick get over the river? Because if he can't, at nightfall, I'm going to have to pull most of his troops away, march them six miles overland to get them to Kelly's Ford so that we can get them over the river before noon to take part in the giant battle that Robert E. Lee is going to start by attacking the troops that French has inserted into Culpeper County. So Rappahannock Station and Kelly's Ford, for that matter, are all in the zone of the Confederate Second Corps under Lieutenant General Richard Yule. There's Rappahannock Station there. Rappahannock Station matters because of the railroad bridge. This is a drawing of Edward Forbes of the bridge uh, in 1862. But the bridge in November of 1863 does not exist. It has been burned by the Federals during their Bristow Station retreat. This is actually the fourth time during the war that the bridge has been burned. It's been rebuilt three times. And it's going to get rebuilt a fourth time. Uh, so this is that, that bridge, don't buy insurance on that bridge because it doesn't hang around for very long. But that's why Rappahannock Station matters. And there's high ground on the north bank, and you can sort of see it right here. And this is where Lee is going to build his bridgehead. This is what it looks like. So this is Rappahannock Station. Of course, this is from 1862, so those buildings have been burned by November of 1863. This is uh, looking from the south bank of the river toward the north bank. Uh, the stone part of this mill is still here. The bridge is gone. Notice how open the terrain is over here east of the railroad, and that's a high wooded ridge there that you see in that tree line. So Meade has already got French doing his thing now. The Federal Fifth and Sixth Corps under Sedgwick are coming down. And since Sedgwick is commanding the wing, today his corps is under the command, who was I think, I think our battery died. Can you all hear me? No, yes, no? I can be louder. <laughs> I will be louder. So Major General Horatio Wright is in command of the 6th Corps, while Sedgwick's got the wing. George Sykes, of course, is in command of the 5th Corps, which has been his job since Meade stepped up on June 28th of 1863 to take command of the Army of the Potomac. Facing these 26,000 Federals are 900 Louisianans, Louisiana Tigers. The way that you'll have this worked out was that he rotated a brigade into the bridgehead every week. So a brigade would spend a week in the bridgehead, then it would come out and a brigade would replace it. The day before, the Stonewall Brigade had left the bridgehead, the Louisiana Tigers had come into it. The Louisiana Tigers, of course, are commanded by Major General Harry Hayes, an experienced and tough fighter who's not with his troops this morning because he's on court-martial duty. So his senior colonel, Davison Penn, of the 7th Louisiana is in charge, and fortunately he too is an experienced and very capable commander. But they got 900 troops and one battery of field artillery, four guns. Most of those troops, three of the regiments, are deployed a quarter of a mile to a half a mile in front of the bridgehead fortifications, basically for observation. So they're out there to keep an eye on the Federals. Where is Stuart's cavalry? There are a few cadets up here, but most of Stuart's cavalry is a little bit on the left flank, a little bit on the right flank, but most of it is around Culpeper Courthouse because the horses have to be fed. And very little grain is coming up from Richmond. And the grazing is better there. Yule's artillery, all of it, except for three batteries, is even further south around Cedar Mountain. Because if they're along the railroad, it's easier for what grain shows up 
to be distributed to the horses. So for logistical reasons, the Confederate cavalry is actually behind the infantry at this particular point. So you have to put your infantry out there to keep an eye on what's going on. Only the 9th Louisiana and the four guns of the Louisiana Guard Artillery are actually in the fortifications. The 5th Louisiana is manning fortifications on the south bank east of the railroad. And about 1 o'clock, between noon and 1 o'clock, the head of two entire Federal Infantry Corps show up and begin to deploy into line of battle. 26,000 federal troops, 900 Confederates with four pieces of artillery. And if Sedgwick had simply got his first two brigades into line and said, go see what you can find out, Penn would have had no choice but to abandon the bridgehead. And Sedgwick would be well on his way to leaping the river and doing exactly what Meade needs him to do. But Sedgwick does not know how many Confederates are in front of him, and he's got Meade's orders saying that those are strong earthworks, they might be impregnable to assault. Remember that this bridgehead exists so that the Confederates can launch a massive counterattack out of it if we are not careful. And John Sedgwick believes in being careful. He had proved how careful he could be facing entrenchments at Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville campaign. And so he's going to take his time, how much time he's going to spend nearly three hours deploying his entire 26,000 man force. And that's going to give the Confederates some badly needed time to recover from their surprise. Penn pulls his three regiments back, leaving only a line of skirmishers. He brings the 5th Louisiana over the river. To reinforce the bridgehead, he sends word back to Yule and to his division commander, Jubal Early, and to Robert E. Lee. There are two Yankee Corps that have just shown up in front of Rappahannock Station. Help! The only help that's close by are two batteries of artillery that have been staged for the purpose. They rush forward and take position in some pre-dug earthworks on high ground on the south bank, both Lee and Early go galloping up to the scene. Notice that Lee doesn't go to Kelly's Ford. Yule's there managing things. This is what we expect the Federals to do. We've got a plan. It's in motion. What Lee needs to know is what's happening at Rappahannock Station. Is his bluff there going to work? Are we going to attract and stymie as many Federals as I need to attract and stymie to make the attack at Kelly's Ford tomorrow morning doable? So he comes here. Early orders his division to come up. Anderson's division of Hill's Corps is ordered to come up. And the Confederates have then done everything that they can do. So Sedgwick misses a big opportunity here. If he had just sent the leading edge of his wing forward, he gets Rappahannock Station probably without even firing a shot. But he's careful and he's cautious, so he spends three hours deploying 26,000 men. That's going to have an impact, though, a very important impact, because these Louisiana Tigers watch 26,000 Federals go in front of them and they're 900 guys. And they're on the wrong side of the river. And there's a single pontoon bridge that links them to the other side of the river. And they know that most potential reinforcements are five, six, seven miles away. So psychologically, these guys know if the Federals throw even a fraction of the weight they have in front of us in our direction, we're not stopping. And being good veteran troops, the one thing they know that they don't want to do is throw their lives away in a futile gesture. So Sedgwick deploys his command, and then he gives his orders. He's going to advance, but not his whole force, only a division on either side of the railroad. On the east side of the railroad, Brigadier General Joseph Bartlett is going to lead a division forward in a column of divisions. That means every regiment's two companies across, five companies deep, nice compact formation. They're going to be moving behind a line of skirmishers. On the west side of the railroad, Brigadier General Albion Howe is going to go forward with the division, again behind skirmishers, but is their job to assault and to take the earthworks? And the answer is no. Their job is not to do that. 
So they're going to support the skirmishers. The Confederate skirmishers fire and pull back. The Federal skirmishers come forward. The 5th Vermont swings around, takes Beverly Ford, then moves down the bank of the river toward the flank of the Confederate position. But as soon as these skirmishers are in place, their support stop because all Cedric wants to do here is to seal off the bridgehead, to surround it with skirmishers. On the west side of the river, Howe's division is supposed to take the ridge where the Confederate skirmishers initially were so that the Federals can put artillery up there and try and shell the Confederates into retreat. So another missed opportunity. If even one of these two divisions had kept going, the Confederates have no choice but to retreat. They can't hold the bridgehead. But Cedric's being careful. Going to seal this thing off, going to bring up artillery, going to try and shell them out of these fortifications. I don't want to launch an infantry assault against those earthworks. The advancing Federals, however, notice how weak the Confederates are. And in fact, they're very weak. Even when he brings all of his troops in to the fortifications, Penn doesn't have enough men to hold the entire line, not in strength. He's got two regiments on the left, got the other three on the right, and in the center, he's just got a skirmish line. And Hal understands that, and he goes to Wright, and he begs him, let me attack. And Wright says, no, if you try it, the Confederate guns on the south bank of the river will blow you to pieces. There's only one problem. There's no Confederate artillery on the south bank. There's nobody there to blow anybody to pieces. But Wright commanding a corps for the first time, has been in one battle as a division commander at Secessionville back in the summer of 1862, doesn't have a lot of combat experience. He's going to be careful too. And so the Federals go into line, the Yankee artillery comes up, and for the next two hours, they're going to try and shell and snipe the Confederates into retreat. So what are the Federals looking at? We've been fighting here before in 1862 as part of the Second Manassas Campaign. And this is a drawing by Edwin Forbes at that time. And he makes it from the high ground that Sedgwick's artillery has occupied. And so this tells us quite a bit about the Confederate position. Interestingly enough, no one on either side draws a map of this action at all. Not in the official records, not in the official atlas. There's nobody puts what this looked like on paper, so a little detective work. So here is the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. That's the Rappahannock River there. Those are the hills on the south bank where the reinforcing Confederate artillery has gone into line. All of these buildings, of course, are gone by the time that we're talking about. And this is the ridge on which the Confederate fortifications are based. The house up here there's a small Confederate fort with two guns here. In the middle, there's a larger Confederate fort with two guns. Uh, and then right down here is the Freeman's Ford Road that runs from Freeman's Ford off to the west all the way over to Kelly's Ford, six miles to the east. It's sort of a sunken road uh, at, at this juncture. It's about 200 yards from the Confederate fortifications up here on this ridge. So, quarter of a mile between the base of this hill and this position uh, right here. But what do the Confederate fortifications actually look like? And this is important because Jubal Early is going to argue after the battle is lost that the fortifications were defective and that's why the Federals win. As I said, nobody drew an official map. But that doesn't mean people didn't draw maps. In my research, I found two maps that were drawn by federal participants in the battle shortly after it occurred. And they tell us something, tell us a lot of important things. So they're not exactly the same. Neither one of them has a scale. One was drawn by a guy east of the railroad. One was drawn by a guy west of the railroad. And so that sort of accounts for uh, their differences. But the essential character is that the river makes a bend, and the Confederate fortifications are in that bend of the river. Okay? There's the railroad. The railroad, remember, has been torn up. It's gone, but the railroad bed is still there. And at this particular point in uh, Virginia, uh, the, it's a raised railroad bed. It's like 10 or 12 feet high so that you know, when there's floods, it's not going to destroy 
uh, the railroad. Most of the Confederate fortifications are west of the railroad and they sort of conform to the river. There's the pontoon bridge that's the link to the South Bank. There are the two hills where the Confederate South Bank artillery is. There's the small fort. Then there's 300 yards of trench connecting to a larger fort. The small fort is completely enclosed. This larger fort is opened back and then the Confederate line curves around to touch the river. Just behind it, the river is unfordable because in the 1840s, the Rappahannock Canal Company had come up and had built a dam uh, just uh, above the, where the railroad bridge was going to wind up to create a pond for canal boats. So the river is much wider here than it is in other places, and it's way too deep for fording. And of course, it's early November, so the water is dangerously cold. And any man jumping into it is apt to drown because his blood vessels are going to constrict and his muscles will quit working and under he is going to go. Notice also that right here on the east bank of the railroad, this is what you usually don't see in modern maps, is a second grouping of Confederate fortifications about 168 yards long that meet this railroad embankment and then go east until they turn back toward the river conforming to the course of a little creek called Tin Pot Run that courses along on the north side of the hills where Sedgwick's artillery is, runs under the ONA and then empties into the Rappahannock right here. So there's a bit of Confederate earthwork on that side of the river. If you look at this map, it basically shows you the same thing, but it doesn't have this East Bank fortification. But what it does show you here is that the Confederate line zigzags. And this is important because in most maps, including the one on the American Battlefield Trust or the Battlefield Trust Now um, website, it just shows a nice graceful curve. No military man builds a line of fortifications that are a nice, graceful curve because that diffuses your fire, doesn't allow any crossfire. That's why you dig zigzag so that you can put crossfire on the enemy, and you can see that the line is zigzagged here. Something else that's very important that this map shows, <clears throat> and I know you can't see it, but this is incredibly important. So there's your pontoon bridge, okay? The whole purpose of this position is as a bridgehead, or a tête de pont, as the French call it. And that's, that's what Lee calls it, a good military term he would have learned at West Point. The whole reason this position exists is to allow Confederate troops in force to cross that pontoon bridge, exit these fortifications, and then attack to the north to cut Meade's supply line or get between him and Washington. Obviously, that means you've got to have a road. And that means you cannot build a solid wall of earth blocking your road. Remember that the Confederate forces defending this are usually a quarter of a mile to half a mile in front of it. They've got to be able to leave the entrenchments to go to those observation points. And so where two roads cross the earthworks, there are gaps in the fortifications. And the Confederates are defending those gaps by building two smaller works in front of them. So if you've ever had to drive onto a secure installation or a military post and zigzag through all those barricades, you know exactly what we're talking about here. So here's your main line, two gaps where the roads cross, and then about 50 yards in front of those two little outer works covering those gaps. And this is the weakest part of the line. There are no ditches in front of this. There's no abatis. And for good reason, because if it's a launching pad for offensive and you gunk up the ground in front of it with a bunch of that stuff, you can't move through it either, right? There are some naturally occurring ditches, drainage ditches that are in front of these works, about 150 yards in front of the main work, but nothing engineers have created. Early's not happy about that. He thinks the, these works have all kinds of flaws. In fact, they're kind of sophisticated. The 300 yards connecting the small and the large fort is a stepped trench. Anybody who studied World War I will recognize that. And the idea here is that if the enemy gets in the trench, he can't shoot down the length of it. You've got all these little bins that protect you from both that kind of fire and insulating artillery fire. The Confederate fortifications are, as Lee puts it, slight but he thinks they're good enough to do 
what they need to do, but what they are not are the pictures you've seen of Brady from the defenses of Richmond and Petersburg or the Atlanta campaign. They're not like that. They're not like that at all. They're going to be a little bit stronger now, though, because the first of Early's brigades shows up under the command of Colonel Archibald Godwin. This is actually Hoke's brigade from North Carolina, which was commanded by Avery at Gettysburg until he was struck down by federal fire. Uh, Hoke and Hayes brigades launched the twilight assault on Cemetery Hill on July 2nd that took that position briefly and would have won the battle if Confederate reinforcements had been able to reach the scene. If there are two units in the Confederate Army that understand the possibilities and dangers of a sudden night attack, it's these two units. Hoke is not with them, nor is the 21st North Carolina. They've been sent home to North Carolina to round up deserters. Nonetheless, this is a fairly big brigade. The 54th North Carolina, that's a big regiment for the Confederate Army, 580 men. November of 1863. Why does it have that many men? It wasn't Gettysburg. So if there's one unit in the Confederate Army that doesn't understand the dangers of a twilight assault, it's the biggest regiment in the fortifications. They were guarding the prisoners taken at Winchester in the opening phases of Lee's Pennsylvania invasion. They're under Archibald Godwin. He's a Virginian. God, he's like six foot seven. Monster of a man for 1863. And he's a competent officer. And they come up and they go racing across the pontoon bridge under artillery fire to reinforce Penn. Harry Hayes shows up at about the same time and crosses the Tom Brune Ridge and takes command of his brigade. Lee's surprised to see Godwin going into the fortifications because he's not sure yet how much force he wants to commit here. They only got about an hour and 20 minutes till dark. Sedgwick hasn't done anything but open an artillery bombardment. He's got half the Army of the Potomac standing still in front of these earthworks. That's exactly what he wants to have happen. And he wants to accomplish that with as little force and as little risk as he possibly can. But Early says, look, Penn's only got a skirmish line holding the center of his front. He needs help. And Lee says, okay, they're going in. Let them go ahead. We've only got about an hour to worry about it now anyway. So now you've got about 2,000, 2,100 Confederate troops inside the bridgehead. The 7th and 5th Louisiana from Hayes over here on this flank. Then the 54th North Carolina, the 6th North Carolina, the 57th. And then over here in this detached work, which is completely isolated from the rest of the position, is the 6th Louisiana with about men. Two guns of Louisiana Guard Artillery in the small fort, which is so small it can only hold those two guns. Then connecting the trench, the trench connecting these two, the 9th Louisiana, and then the 8th Louisiana holding the large redoubt, this part of the works where you have a broken line of entrenchments and two guns right there. And you see the Federal skirmishers firing away, the Union artillery is up here blazing away, and this is the position as it is going to be when the Federals make their attack. So at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, with maybe about 30, 40 minutes of fading light left, you have a stalemate. When Hoke's brigade comes in, Sedgwick sees that as the beginning of a possible Confederate counterattack. And so he orders the rest of the Sixth Corps up to get into line behind that ridge with Howe. He brings up more artillery, but this sort of tells us something. Sedgwick is as worried about fending off an attack as he is about making one. Making one. So Lee and Early are watching this. The artillery fire is going back and forth. The, the sun is down now. The, the light is beginning to drain from the sky. And Lee and Early both agree, well, this is kind of the end of it. The Federals aren't going to do anything else today. They're certainly not going to make a night attack. Ergo, Lee's plan is working exactly the way it is supposed to work. And he rides back to his headquarters to prepare to bring Hill over to join Rhodes and Johnson in launching a massive assault against French's troops who have gotten over the Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford. And that's probably the way things would have gone if not for this guy right here, Brigadier General David Russell, who because Wright is commanding the 6th Corps, has moved up to command the 1st Division from the 1st Brigade, which is now under Colonel Peter Elmaker. And Russell 
Russell is a special kind of guy. He's one of these generals who goes forward to the skirmish line to see what's going on. He's also the man, along with Howe, who in May of 1863 had attacked the Confederate fortifications at Marie's Heights at Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville campaign and had carried them by assault. These guys aren't afraid of fortifications. They're not daunted by earthworks. And how, and as remember, begged already to make an attack, and Wrighty told him no. But Russell rides forward to his skirmish line. His skirmish line is basically here, 121st New York, and the 6th Main, at least half of the 6th Main, the other half is on reserve. They're in this sunken road, about 200 yards to the Confederate fortifications. And Russell's been looking at things, and he says, you know what, this, this Confederate line is weak. He thinks it's just a skirmish line. I can take this. And so he goes, sends a messenger back to Wright, and he, and he asks for permission to make an assault. And he has a good plan. So here's his scheme. Most of the six corps behind this ridge, right up here. You got the six main here, 121st New York. 121st is from Upton's brigade. The six main is from uh, Russell's own brigade, now under Elmaker. He says, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to send the other half of the 6th Main over the ridge forward as a skirmish line. The Confederates will see it. Fine, we want them to see it. No one think anything of it. Just before dark, this is one skirmish line exchanging places with another skirmish line. They'll pay no attention. But in fact, once the second half of the 6th Main gets into this sunken road, those troops are going to fix bayonets, uncap their muskets so they had no intention or... Uh, ability to stop and shoot, and they're going to launch an immediate attack. And we're going to catch the Confederates by surprise. They're going to go after this big fort. And as they start to move, we're going to bring the 5th Wisconsin, and then the 119th Pennsylvania and the 49th Pennsylvania, which is only four companies uh, big at this point, and they're going to come up in these columns of division, so a compact battering ram body of men, and they're going to cross that ground five minutes between each of these three waves, and they're going to come in and they're going to reinforce this assault on the big fort. We'll take it, then we'll take the bridge, and the whole Confederate force is cut off. And it'll be destroyed or forced to surrender. And at first, writes like, oh, no, we can't do that, because that's suicide. But then he thinks about it for a moment. It's like, it's almost dark. The Confederates won't be able to see well. This just might work. And so he gives Russell permission to make the attack. And Russell's going to be a very lucky fellow, because even though he's commanding the division, he's sending forward a single brigade. If this attack goes in just the way he plans it, he's outnumbered. If he makes this attack in broad daylight where the Confederates can see how many troops are coming at him, they're going to get shot to pieces and this is going to fail. He's going to make it in the fading light and he's not going to make it alone. Colonel Thomas Allen of the 5th Wisconsin and Colonel Benjamin Harris of the 6th Maine have the primary role in this, but they're not the only people who are going to attack. He's going to have unexpected help. Help that has no orders to take part in this thing. So over here, by the half of the 6th Main that's on the line, 50 men, skirmishers from the 121st New York under Captain John Fish. And Fish has only one order that's been given to him but it's by his brigade commander, Emory Upton. Stay up with the forward advance. So when the 6th Main moves forward, Fish says, well, that's the forward advance. I guess I'm supposed to go forward too. And luckily for the Federals, the part of the line that he's going to hit is the weakest section of it. And his 50 men are going to have an outsized impact on what's going to happen. To the left of the 6th Main is the 20th Main. 20th Main is from the 5th Corps. It's actually supposed to be on the other side of the railroad embankment. But the railroad curves a little bit as it comes down toward the river. So 75 men from the 5th Main had advanced forward as skirmishers. 50 of them wound up on the wrong side of the railroad. And they've been sitting there sniping at the Confederates along with the 6th Main. And they're, the commander of these skirmishers, Major William Morrell, wanders over to visit with some old buddies, neighbors back home from the 6th Main. And so he's there when Harris brings forward the second half 
of the 6 Main and is explaining the battle plan. And one of Harris's officers who knows Morrell sees him eavesdropping and says, want to come with us? And Morrell says, do I? You bet I do. And he runs over to his 50 guys on the west side of the road. He says, boys, the 6 Main's beside us and they're going in. Let's go in with them. And it wouldn't be appropriate for one bunch of main guys to go and the other bunch of main guys to stay. So they're going to go in too. Which means they're going to hit the 9th Louisiana and this small fort, one of whose guns has already been knocked out by federal sharpshooters. Here's the thing though. When the 20th Maine or this 50 men of it that are over here go forward, the 25 guys who are over here and they've got a connecting file. So they've got some poor sap who's up here on the railroad embankment who's keeping an eye on the other side of the field, when those 50 guys from the 20th Maine go forward, these 25 guys from the 20th Maine say, I guess somebody gave an order that we didn't hear, and so we should go forward too. And when those 25 goes, guys go forward, the other skirmishers over here say, okay, I guess somebody gave orders that we didn't hear, I guess we're supposed to go forward. And they do. And this essentially doubles the size of Russell's attacking force. And if these guys don't go in, even attacking at dusk, even using this clever way to you know, get his initial assault wave in place, this thing probably still failed. And this is what it looked like. So Edwin Forbes is here, and he draws a picture of the battle. So there's the Rappahannock. There are the pillars of the Burnt Railroad Bridge. There's the embankment. See how tall it is? Here are the Fifth Corps skirmishers, so you know, judging. These are the hills on the south bank where the Confederate artillery is. This is the small fort. This is the ridge right here. This is the Confederate trench on the east side. And suddenly, something like 350 federal skirmishers come at the 6th Louisiana out of the gathering twilight. And a few hours earlier, they had watched a whole federal division advance at them to suddenly stop and go to ground. Several hours before that, they saw an entire federal corps deploy to just stop. And now they see these skirmishers coming forward, and Colonel Monaghan, who commands the regiment, has no reason to suspect that a line of skirmishers is coming forward without something pretty substantial behind it. Maybe that federal division, maybe that entire federal corps, and I got 180 guys and we're completely cut off from everybody else. And we're not gonna stop him. And so he gives the order to his regiment to move by its left flank, to file down to the railroad, and then to ford the stream by the pillars where it is at least somewhat fordable. Only about half of the regiment gets over the river before the federal skirmishers sweep up onto the riverbank. They begin to fire at the retreating Confederate troops, dropping some of them, shooting them in the back. The Federals, as they reload, decide that's, that's not the way we do things. They begin to yell at the Confederates to turn around and surrender. And about 75 of the guys halfway across the river turn around, begin to come back. And then one of the six Louisiana officers steps out from behind a pylon, brandishing his sword and pistol and orders them, no, turn around and go back to our side. And so these troops turn around and start to head toward the south bank. And the Federals open fire on them again. And most of them go and hide behind the pillars of the railroad until they can surrender. And about 90 men from the 6th Louisiana are captured in this way. And the entire eastern side of the Confederate fortification is gone. And the battle's hardly started. On the other side of the railroad, this is the scene. So there's your embankment. There's the small fort. There's the connecting trench. There's the large redoubt. So you've got the 20th Maine skirmishers going up here. There's the 6th Main. As it comes up onto the large fort, it gets hit. It gets hit hard by three volleys. Good number of its men, most of its officers go down. Colors go down. The Federals go to ground. A lot of them begin to, to cry out that they surrender. And Hayes reports, we stopped the first assault. But then there are other Federals who are saying, no, no, go in, go in. And so they surge up onto the works. A handful of them get in. They're quickly driven out. They try a third time. 
And there's this fight going on along the edge of the earthworks and these six main guys looking back for the 5th Wisconsin, which is supposed to already be here, and it's not. Because the 5th Wisconsin had orders to go in with unloaded muskets, or uncapped muskets, because uncapped you can't shoot, and the last thing that any officer wants is for his men to stop and begin to fire in an attack like this, because once men stop and start shooting, you don't get them moving again. So if you can't shoot, You've got one choice, and that's to go forward and deal with the enemy with the bayonet. But the 5th Wisconsin, they're veterans, and they start out with uncapped muskets, unloaded muskets. And then they say, uh, no, we're not doing it this way. And one of, one of Russell's aides is saying, no, no, you're supposed to go in with only the bayonet. And they say, this guy must think we're greenhorns. And so without orders, they start loading their muskets while they're moving. There's a lot of grousing and griping, the rattle of ramrods, and Colonel Allen finally hears that, and he turns around, he's been riding in front of his men, and he's like, what's up? And they say, they're trying to send us in with unloaded muscles, and we're not going to do it. So he halts the regiment, and he orders them to load. But the whole time that's happening, the 6th Maine is already moving. So it takes 10 minutes, not 5, for the Wisconsin troops to get up there. But when they do, they make all the difference in the world, because this fight for the large fort, is deadlocked and the 5th Wisconsin sends one of its wings up to reinforce that, the other wing to reinforce the 20th Main, fighting for the connecting trench and the small fort. Luckily for the Federals, Captain Fish and his 50 guys, when they hit this part of the works, have remarkable success. So the, the parapets here are not tall. And the trenches behind them are very narrow. So the Confederate troops in those trenches can't really aim straight ahead. So if the Federals, once they get up on the parapet, they can't aim like this. They almost have to shoot perpendicular. And Fish and his men get up there, shoot some of them down. And again, these Louisianans saw two Federal Corps deploy in front of them earlier in the day. And given the formations that the Federals are using, these dense, compact bodies of men, the Confederates believe now they're unleashing all of this on us. This is going to be wave after wave after wave of attackers, and we're not going to stop them. And so 150 losing surrender to Fish and his 50 men. And that guts the 8th Louisiana. And although the 6th and 57th North Carolina turn around and begin to put an enfilade fire in there that forces Fish and his men against the large uh, fort here, they've already pierced the weakest part of the Confederate line. Now the 5th Louisiana, or I'm sorry, the 5th Wisconsin shows up and a vicious hand-to-hand -hand fight takes place inside that large redoubt, as mean as anything that the war sees. But there are too many Federals now and they drive Hayes and his men out. They counterattack. It doesn't work. And so now the small fort's gone, the big fort's gone, and what's left of the 8th and 9th Louisiana begin to drift back toward the bridge. Three federal troops caught up in the excitement rush down to this mass of discombobulated men. It's now almost completely dark. These three federal privates fire their muskets in the air and demand a surrender. And 180 Confederates give up. They don't know what's in front of them. They expect it's hundreds and hundreds of Federals, and they're basically vulnerable. We could be shot down at the moment. Russell had underestimated the resistance he was going to get. He sent a series of couriers back to Emory Houston and told him to bring forward two regiments to reinforce the fight. Interesting that once again, Russell, who's commanding the division, says, just bring me two regiments. So he's still doing this on the cheap. Upton is supposed to come forward and join the fight for the large redoubt, but as he nears the battlefield, Russell says, I've already got this, and he rides up to uh, Upton, and he says, I want you to change the direction of your attack. Now you need to take out the salient of the Confederate line that's infiltrating the troops who've taken this portion of the earthwork. So Upton leads his men forward, deploys them into line, launches an immediate attack, very boldly, very quickly, and he hits part of the 54th North Carolina, that big regiment that wasn't at Gettysburg, that didn't take part in that evening attack on Cemetery Hill, and the one most vulnerable to being, well, freaked out by what's happened. And the 54th has spread out to try and occupy some of the trench 
abandoned by the 6th and 57th when they refused the flank. And after a very brief struggle, Upton takes those works. And now he notices that the Confederates off to his right are completely disorganized. And he sees an opportunity here, so he sends word to Russell, I'm renewing the attack. And here Upton, who gets retroactively gets a lot of credit for this because of what happens at the wilderness and the mule shoe and that's all his and it's like oh he's the guy who came. This is Russell's battle not Upton's. Russell's the guy who came up with these tactics not Upton. But what Upton does is he brilliantly exploits the breakthrough that's happened. By the way this is Alfred Wode. Remember he's at Kelly's Ford but he drew this seen afterwards so the, this is not what the fighting looked like at all but if we want verification of our maps there's the small fort, there's the large fort, the pontoon bridge, see how deep the slope is, and notice the Confederate line zigzags. So we have visual verification of our map. So what does Upton do now? He sends one battalion from the 121st New York to seize the pontoon bridge. He leaves one battalion of the 5th Maine to hold the trenches he's got, and then he takes a battalion from each regiment, and he pulls them out of the line, back to the front, down slope of the Confederate fortifications. Halts them, reorganizes them into a line of battle, orders them to right face so that they form a column of march. Then he double quicks them across the face of the Confederate works in the darkness, down slope, so the enemy can't see him and certainly can't effectively shoot at him. And then when the rear of his column becomes adjacent to Confederate works. He orders his men to move by the left flank, throwing them immediately into a line of battle without stopping. Then he halts them and then shouts out in a very loud voice that he knows that the Confederates can hear, Men, there are four lines of battle behind us. When the enemy opens fire, you will lay down and the other three lines will charge over you. There's nobody behind these guys. But it's dark. Confederates don't know that, but they do know there could be four lines or ten because there are two federal corps out there and surely we're not being attacked by one and a half brigades. And this works. When Upton orders the charge, the 54th North Carolina basically collapses. Same problem, low parapets, narrow trenches, there's hardly a fight at all. And suddenly the Federals are being handed armfuls of swords from the officers. They get the 54th colors. But now Upton has basically spent his strength, but there are still two Confederate regiments off here to the left, the 7th and 5th Louisiana, which have been shooting at Federal skirmishers. It's very windy. It's carrying all the noise to the north and away from the battle. These are Hayes troops. They figure everything's fine behind them. Hayes hasn't called for them to help anywhere. They've heard shooting, but they have no idea that essentially the center and, and right of the whole Confederate line has already collapsed. So they're still facing basically to the west. And Colonel Clark Edwards, in command of the 5th Maine, sees some of the 54th North Carolina running off in this direction, and he determines he's going to catch these fugitives. So he takes 12 guys, and he runs after them. And after about 30 or 40 yards, he suddenly finds himself standing almost in the line of file closures behind the 5th Louisiana. Whoops, that's the wrong place to be with 12 guys looking at the back of two Confederate regiments. And so Edwards, who's a gutsy guy, decides to bluff. He demands to know who's in charge of this part of the line. And Captain John Angel of the 5th Louisiana, who's only got 125 men, hears that and he turns around and he says, I am, who wants to know? And he says, I'm Colonel Edwards of the 5th Maine. I demand your surrender. And this is the first that Angel knows that there are even Yankees inside the works. And he's like, uh, what? And he says, I want your surrender. And Angel, stalling for time, says, well, let me consult my officers. And Edward says, I won't give you one minute. Surrender now. And Angel still hesitates, so he turns around. He says, you see all those men moving back there behind me? Those are two regiments. And if you don't surrender now, they're going to come down, and they're going to shoot you in the back. Those are Confederate prisoners being herded to the rear. Okay. There's nobody back there. And Angel still kind of like, nah, yeah. and so playing his last card, Edward says, 121st New York, 5th Maine, charge. And Angel says, that's it, we're done. 
And when the 5th Louisiana lays down its arms, well, the 7th Louisiana has no choice but to lay down its arms as well. This leaves only the 6th and 57th North Carolina under uh, Colonel Tate. Uh, his, uh, or I'm sorry, under Godwin, Colonel Tate of the 6th North Carolina urges him to cut his way to the bridge and escape. But Godwin, showing more gallantry than sense, says, I have no orders to retreat. And so he does it. And instead, he has to surrender when the Federals close in on him and overwhelm the small force that he has left. The Confederates who can retreat across the bridge, most of the guys with horses get away, including Hayes. But the horses all get shot, mostly killed, as they get across the bridge. The Confederates, after great difficulty, are going to be able to burn at least part of that pontoon bridge. Uh, and the Federals are not going to get over the river that night but they have destroyed the bridgehead. 1,600 prisoners, seven flags, four pieces of artillery. That's what they've managed to accomplish, but too late. Sedgwick had missed the chance to hit the bridgehead when he first showed up, then he missed the chance to hit it when he moved forward his first divisions, and now he attacks, or rather Russell attacks. Sedgwick never gives the order to attack. Russell's idea, Wright's order, or Wright's permission, but it's dark. There's no way to exploit the victory. And it's not until 10 o'clock that Meade is certain what has been or not been accomplished at Rappahannock Station. And since at dark, Early's division is still on this side of the river, Sedgwick says, I've got the bridgehead. I can try and push over the river tomorrow, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it or not. Meade still has to pull most of Sedgwick's troops, march them six miles over to Kelly's Ford, get them across the river before Lee launches the big counterattack, which of course Lee is now not going to launch because his entire scheme of defense has been undone by Russell's attack. So Lee orders his quartermasters to pack everything up and to get on the road for the Rapidan. They do that with commendable speed, although great in elegance because things are just thrown into wagons. The wagons hurry off at a blistering pace the infantry stays in place until midnight, and then it backs up to a line two miles in front of Culpeper Courthouse, and it digs in. And interestingly, this is without orders. This is the first instance in the war where the troops are simply going to turn to and dig in. This is the beginning of what's going to happen in 1864, right here. They have to make a stand for the entire next day because they've got to give their wagons time to get across the river. And this is a bad place because the left flank is completely in the, uh, in the air. And although they've got some troops on Pony Mountain here, there's only a couple miles between it and the river, and if the Federals were to swoop down and turn that flank, they could potentially cut off the whole Army of Northern Virginia. Lee deploys Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry at Brandy Station and Hamptons towards Stevensburg along the probable federal lines of advance to stall Meade the next morning he sends Lane's North Carolina Brigade toward Rixieville to do the same thing but this is as vulnerable a position as the Army of Northern Virginia has ever held. Meade has wrested the initiative from Lee and there is a remarkable opportunity here if he can move fast and hit hard but that supposes he knows what he's accomplished and the fact is he doesn't know what he's accomplished. French has two divisions over the river, and that's it. So Meade's still most concerned against a Confederate counterattack. So he spends the night getting most of the 6th Corps and some of the 5th and 4th to reinforce against that potential counterattack. And then once those troops are forward, he moves to defend that bridgehead, sends the 3rd Corps up to reinforce the 6th, which is now down to basically a strength of two divisions. They link up at Brandy Station. Their advanced elements are a little shy of Brandy Station. Their advanced elements will push Fitzlee back to Brandy Station. But basically, Meade is acting very much defensively here, preparing for a counterattack. On November 8th, most of the Army of Potomac moves all of five or six miles. Five or six miles. And between Lane and Fitzlee and Hampton, the Federals are held far away from this vulnerable line held by the Army of Northern Virginia. Lane gives Buford's division a bloody nose up around Rixieville. 
uh, and keeps it from getting closer to Culpeper Courthouse. And at 3 p.m. on November 8th, the Federal Army stops with three hours of daylight left and it goes into camp. Just three miles separates it from the Confederate battle line. If the Federals had kept going, they would have found the rebels before dark. Probably couldn't have done much to them, but they could have started a battle that entangled Lee's army and would prevent it from retreating that night. Or at the very least, cause Lee to leave a substantial rear guard behind that Meade could then have thrown the entire army of the Potomac against. But Meade had not thought he could get over the river at all. He's half surprised that he did. So is Abraham Lincoln, by the way. When Lincoln hears that, he sends Meade a well done that just crackles with surprise delight. And having played for limited stakes and not finding the Confederates at Brandy Station where he expected them, Meade says, good enough, and we'll stop here. And so he surrenders the initiative that he had won the evening before, and that allows Lee that night unmolested to retreat back across the Rapidan River so that by the middle of November, we're exactly where we were in the middle of September of 1863, as though the Bristow Station campaign had never happened. Almost exactly where the armies were when they finally came to rest after the Gettysburg campaign. So this was a huge success for the Federals in a tactical sense. It certainly thrilled northern newspaper readers. A twilight assault on a fortified Confederate position that wipes out the Louisiana Taggers, takes seven flags, 1,600 prisoners. And for the Federals, not, not too expensive. 96 dead, 409 wounded, most of those in Russell's command. For the Confederates, most of two brigades are wiped out and an entire battery of artillery. This is a very bitter blow for the Confederates, but strategically, all it manages to do is to shove the Army of Northern Virginia back behind the Rapidan River and present Meade with the same problems that he had faced earlier in the fall. How do I get at the rebels in their fortified position on the south bank of that particular stream? And it's gonna take Meade a few weeks to figure it out, but when he does, is going to lead to the Mine Run Campaign, which is the last volume in the series of books uh, that I am working on, and thus the Battle of Rappahannock Station. Thank you, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer. Mm -hmm.